Let's, let's get started. Um, everybody is busy running around, and I think they can find the room. Now that I tweeted it, so <laughs> everybody will be here. Right, okay. I'm uh, Stefano Maffulli. I'm uh, uh, at Dreamos to take care of marketing and uh, community mostly. And Caleb? I'm Caleb Boylan. Um, I work under Steph as the customer advocate intern uh, on the cloud team. Yeah, so today we're going to talk a little bit about how we've been uh, serving our customers uh, at Dreamhost and uh, developers mostly, and how we've gone from taking documentation from upstream and put it into a product knowledge base for the Dreamhost cloud. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Dreamhost. It's, uh, it's a company started in 1997. So we survived the first dot-com burst. Uh, we're still thriving, we're still going on. And since then, we've been serving developers, um, people who wanted to be to have a presence online. And historically, uh, Dreamhost has always been the place where not only you get hosting, but you also get a shell, for example. So it was one of the very few people, places on the planet <laughs> where you could actually do that. And we allowed a lot of um, um, interactions. We, our customers are particularly um, um, uh, attached to, to the brand. They get um, very good customer service. And um, over the years, we've gone from going from serving customers that were developers lots, uh, with lots of experience or knowledge hands-on on how to run systems, like a PHP system or an Apache system, and LAMP stack in general. Uh, we started. Um, offering also product, products that, were, that are m mostly hands-off, like hosted and managed WordPress as a service. So we, we started mixing uh, users who want to just, customers who just want to write a blog or um, be designers and show their, uh, their design, uh, and less about development or system administrators. Um, so we started losing when we when we deployed OpenStack um, and in our product that it's called Dream Compute. Well, we realized that a lot of these new uh, users, cust existing customers, are um, less familiar with uh, putting getting their hands dirty on administering the systems. So, and to give you you know a brief history of Dream Compute, also we launched it for in general general availability in early April. So it's about it's been running for a month. Um, great, great um, uh, welcome <laughs> or you know, great reactions from, from users. Um, but um, finalists in the Super User Award too, uh, we have seen today that we got close to winning, close. Uh, and um, um, so we, we're catering to developers and people who want to create uh, systems, create applications, deploy their applications on a full scale OpenStack public cloud. And um, we realized um, once we were, I started there about a year ago, after the Vancouver summit, basically, and I started looking at the, the way the, uh, I surveyed our customers in the beta program, uh, Dream Compute beta program. And I realized that we were talking about a lot about these amazing things that the cloud could do. We had uh, pro been proposing this thing that you could, you know, you could run around the block with it. You could build things fantastic and amazing. But then we were just throwing them pieces. We were giving them the building block and said, ah, you can do it. You can do it too. And it, it, was, it felt to me like we had this wonderful play playground full of all the bells and whistles. The, and we were talking about compute and virtual servers and memory and scaling up, scaling out, and networks that you can create and destroy, and level two, and level three, um, and storage in all, in all, the, in all kind of um, declination. But we were, not, we were not giving users enough information, enough inspiration on how to do things. So I started looking at how we can inspire and instruct our customer base. Uh, that's our, the mission of our team. At this point, it's to instruct um, them on, with documents to do basic things. How to run MySQL in Dream Compute or in OpenStack. Um, and we're working with strong constraints. I mean, the very visible thing is that it's, we are very small as a team. Um, it's only, at this moment, him and I, Caleb and I. Um, 
so we have to be smart about how to do things. We cannot go after huge, um, we cannot build a huge documentation base from scratch only by ourselves. So we want to reuse as much as possible. We want to automate all the things and we want to collaborate with others doing similar things, which is the same approach that OpenStack took five, six years ago, uh, starting from Austin, when they started talking about code. And we want to do the same for uh, documentation. And so we want to reuse as much as possible information that is available upstream, from upstream. The documentation that the OpenStack community has put together for application developers is quite comprehensive. Um, although it's well tested, although um, it's still in, in quantity is limited, there is a very nice uh, uh, first application on, for OpenStack, but that's pretty much it. And then there are the basic building blocks, like how to use Nova, how to Nova client or OpenStack client, uh, or how to use Horizon. So we want to reuse as much as possible uh, that is there. We want how to make, um, as you know, the documentation from OpenStack upstream is written into um, RST format, restructured text. Um, and we want to publish, I mean, the, the end result is always uh, HTML. So we want to go from RST to HTML in a manageable way, but uh, make it automatic. And we also want to collaborate because we know that we can write uh, bits and pieces about how to deploy a LAMP stack on, on uh, Dream Compute. Um, and someone else will write about the Nginx or the MongoDB and how we can mix and match all of those. Uh, we want to do that together with others. And um, so our ideal scenario is that we pull documentation that is done in a collaboration out there, call it upstream. We build the documentation from the uh, restructured text into HTML. We put that documentation into a help desk system or publishing system. And uh, we keep on working on that, uh, receive patches from other, our customers or someone, someone else's customer, and we keep on pushing up and give that cycle um, a very good feeling and useful. So we started venturing up there with this idea about nine months ago. Uh, we started putting it together, the systems, and uh, you know, I, I went into the company at Dreamos, as I said, less than a year ago, and they were already selecting the software for uh, a comprehensive help center. We were, the company was running on uh, MediaWiki. That required changes, updates. Uh, we want, want to get rid of um, MediaWiki on one hand, get rid of the forums that um, are used by our customers right now, and also get rid of the the idea was to get rid of the ticketing system that the support people are using and get into an integrated platform. So the selection process was done before I arrived and we ended up getting with uh, Zendesk. Uh, so, which is a good choice in many aspects because it's got a very powerful REST API. But you know, we started to get into limitations as we were going along. So um, I'll pass this to Caleb who's gonna talk about more how of the technical bits of the integration with Zendesk that we've done. He's all right, done. so uh, Steph mentioned that it's all RST when it's written, um, and then it has to make its way into HTML, which is done with a, sim a simple tox command um, that calls Sphinx. And then it has to make its way into Zendesk. And there's sort of two ways to do that. You can like manually copy and paste the HTML that's built into a web UI, and that's, that's doable, but once you have more than like five articles, it gets really tedious and really boring. Um, but thankfully, Zendesk provides us with a, a decent uh, REST API. Um, so I wrote, I wrote a Python tool just to take an HTML uh, file and, and just basically just throw it at, at Zendesk and put it in the right place and whatnot. Um, and it, it figures out how to upload images that are uh, referenced locally. So it'll put them up onto Zendesk so that they can actually be shown in, in line in the text. Um, but it can't fix articles that are linked locally. That's something that um, I'm looking into. And there's the uh, GitHub link to that script. Um, this is a basic um, example of how that runs. You just 
run the script, give it a HTML file, and give it the section ID, because in Zendesk, every article is in a section. Um, and it just it gives you back the URL for uh, where it's at. Um, so that's great for one article, but what if you have 50 or 100 and you do something that requires you to update all of them and push them back to Zendesk? That's really tedious if you have to tell the script to run each one and you have to tell it also what section to put it in. Um, because if you tell it the wrong section, it'll just duplicate the article and it won't update the, the old one. Um, so I, I came up with this simple YAML thing. Um, and the first field is just the section ID. The second one is the uh, directory that the, that the article lives in relative to this file. And then inside of that is a list of HTML files that you want to publish to that section. Um, and that just, it just loops through all of them, pushes them up, and gives you links back. Um, and so after that, our workflow looks somewhat like this. Um, we fork from Garrett, the upstream Garrett, into GitHub. And the, uh, the article writer just clones it, makes changes, and pushes back to GitHub, pushes onto master, pushes onto a branch. And once it gets merged onto master, they would also build the articles and use the script to push them to Zendesk. Um, this is much better than copying and pasting the HTML into the web UI, but it's still not perfect because that requires um, the, the article writer to have an account and be able to push things back to Zendesk, which in itself is an issue. Um, so we, we wrote a Jenkins job. Um, all it really does is just pulls GitHub for a new commit on master, and once it finds one, it just takes diffs between the current commit on master and the last one that it ran on, and finds all the articles that have changed. If they've changed, it pushes them up to Zendesk. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like now. Um, we fork from Garrett. The, all the article writer cares about is making changes and getting them merged onto master. And then Jenkins abstracts away the layer that is publishing to Zendesk, because that's tedious, and also, like Steph mentioned, we want people who are outside of DreamHost to be able to commit, uh, to commit back into our documentation, uh, which they can't do in the old way because they wouldn't have a login that would allow them to push back into Zendesk. Right, the business model of Zendesk is to sell you accounts. Yeah. So we have only one account, and many people can publish to push to GitHub. Anybody can publish to GitHub. Just don't tell them that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so we do that for, for several upstream repos, including the OpenStack manuals repo, which we take the user guide out of, um, and the API site repo, which has the first app, um, which basically gives you a quick rundown of how to effectively use the cloud to deploy an application. But we also have our specific uh, documentation that is an upstream that we think we need for our users, and that's just basic instructions on how to do common uh, ops things. So like setting up a LAMP stack, um, that's important. Lots of our users do that kind of thing. Or how to use Ansible to, to spin up some instances on Dream Compute. Um, and like we said, anybody can contribute. You make a pull request, one of us will uh, review it. If it gets merged into master, then Jenkins takes care of the rest. Um, so this all sounds great, right? Um, <laughs> but it it's, it's, it works. Um, it has some issues. There's lots of things that we still want to work on to improve some features that we want to add, some things that we want to make Jenkins do um, that it doesn't current, currently do. And after you fork, getting the, the new updates from upstream is still a very manual process. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, so some of the limitations of using the upstream docs is that I'm sure as everybody here knows, every OpenStack cloud is different. The upstream stuff sort of documents a general OpenStack cloud, but the OpenStack you run is probably not that cloud. Um, it's going to maybe support a little bit more than is documented upstream. And it might, uh, the upstream documentation might even document things that you don't support, which you don't want to be telling your users that you do support. Um, and Zendesk doesn't support related page as well. Um, so in Zendesk, you sort of have this hierarchy, or yeah, you have this hierarchy of 
a category, a section, and an article. And there's, you can't build deeper than that. You can't have a category and then a section nested in a section and then an article, which makes it harder to group your articles. Um, so that's an issue that we've had to work around. Um, yeah, Zendesk also supports tags, but yeah. uh, it's still not clear to anyone we asked how to expose those tags to users. So there is no way to cross link. So if something is about PHP and you want to get uh, all the articles tagged PHP, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, and also some of the things that are um, that come out of the, the built upstream docs don't work well in Zendesk. So if you see on the, on the left side of the slide, there's a table of contents. Um, and when you put that into the body of a Zendesk site, it, like, it does some weird formatting things because the CSS isn't there or something. And it, like, it, it basically it looks really ugly. Um, so we've, we've worked around that. And then we also um, change uh, some titles. Yeah, the, the other thing, that if, go back a little bit. The other thing that you wanna, the, we, we notice is that a lot of the documentation from upstream is written as a book. Um, and uh, um, although the page about launching an instance from the command line or from Horizon is self-contained, um, it's, it's part of a larger collection of documents that are all visible into that table of content. So kind of stripping that table of content and leaving launch instances as a title, as a head, header, uh, is not really that useful when you just use it as an individual page in, in our Zendesk. Yep. Um, and so we edit the contents of the documentation um, as you, you sort of just have to because the upstream docs aren't perfect for what you need. They're good for upstream stuff, but um, in, in your, if you're running a public cloud, um, you need to be able to tweak that. And part of what we do is we add our, our specific stuff that we support, like um, public networking or stuff like that. And then we also make changes for SEO reasons. So we, we change the word OpenStack to like Dream Compute, which is our product. Um, and that also helps prevent confusion, because some of our users might not understand when they're reading the docs. When it says OpenStack, it really means you know, what they're using. Um, and that can be confusing. And then we also edit the build configs. Um, so like, like we showed in the last slide, the, we don't uh, publish a sidebar um, because it messes things up. So we change the build config so that that isn't an issue. And we use an alabaster theme, uh, the alabaster theme, instead of using the OpenStack theme because that allowed us to do that easily. In retrospect, it would have made more sense to, to try avoid doing that if possible um, for reasons that we're going to talk about. Um, maybe not. OK. Um, well, this is a basic d uh, diff from the tip of the master of our fork to where we forked it. Um, so you can see the, we changed the title from access an instance through a console to how to access a Dream Compute instance through a console. And then um, OpenStack supports three different kinds of uh, remote console tools. And we only support one, uh, no VNC. So, we just strip out the documentation that says we support the other things and change the wording a little bit so it makes more sense. Um, and then this is what that article looks like after it's made its way into Zendesk. Um, so it, it gets messy because once uh, editing the build configs is dangerous because if you decide, um, and this is a, an issue that we've somewhat hit, um, we're using a different Sphinx version than upstream, which is a big no-no because the upstream community could decide to use a part of Sphinx that is supported in that version but isn't supported in your version. And at that point, you have to figure out a workaround or find a way to get back onto that version with the documentation that you have, which is, that's a mess. Don't do that. Um, and then pulling the updates from upstream gets, gets harder the more you change each article because just basically how, how that works is you do a rebase of your patches onto the current upstream master. And if there are merge conflicts, you have to resolve them manually. And it's very tedious and, <laughs> and not fun. Um, this is, this is a, yeah. Um, so we have lots of different kinds of users. We have, we have people who are new to cloud, people who are not new to cloud but are new to OpenStack, people who are familiar with OpenStack 
And we sort of have to work around doing that, and we have to be able to teach the users that are new to cloud how to properly use the cloud and our cloud specifically without boring the people who are veterans with, with using cloud and, and make sure that they just get the information that they need how they want it. Um, and if, if you're not sure what you're looking at, this is a user that tried to, um, they're, they're in a, a VNC console and they typed an SSH command into a login prompt. Um, because they were told to do so from the document. Reading the documentation, that's what it says. Use SSH uh, on uh, the console. Yeah. But which console <laughs> yeah, is left to interpretation? Yeah. Um. So here's, uh, here's another thing that we found out um, that Zendesk does not serve our purpose. One of the reasons, um, one of the things that I wanted to do uh, with, the, with, uh, with the product knowledge base is to figure out how users are actually using this knowledge base, um, which articles are being most searched, most valuable, voted, commented on, uh, which sections, which topics, which categories are the most popular. Well, Zendesk only has, Zendesk only exposes in the URL of the article, the actual article path which means if any of you is familiar with Google Analytics, um, Google Analytics likes URLs only. So when I get into Google Analytics and try to search for the category Dream Compute Cloud Servers, out of the 170 something categories that we have, or sections that we have in our knowledge base, I, can't, I, can, I cannot find that information. So I cannot uh, filter out which articles are more popular uh, for cloud servers product, um, and uh, that's a big, huge inf uh, limitation. Um, but I do, I do can, I can search, I can see in Google Analytics which search terms are more familiar with, are more, are more used, but I cannot, again, I cannot restrict to a path that where that search originated from, because that URL is not uh, carried over in the topic. So um, it's, Pretty, very limited, and some of the knowledge that I wanted to share, I just don't have it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and but the, you know, the, the good thing is that we have we're not really dependent on on Zendesk. The what we have, uh, the fact that we have based our knowledge base off of uh, restructured text, and we actually build it locally. We build it and we push it through an API. Whatever the API endpoint is, shall we decide to move migrate off of Zendesk? Uh, because the company ended up not choosing Zendesk for the tech support bits, um, we, we can do it. And it's um, interesting because when I started at the company and I proposed initially the idea of using all the cloud documentation, re write it in the uh, restructured text and use this machinery in Python to, to push to an API, the tech writer team uh, that is working on the hosting and web products at Dreamos, they were all like looking at me strange, funny. Like, well, why, want it, why do you want to do that? There is a nice HTML WYSIWYG inside Zendesk. Why don't you just copy and paste or you know, author directly into a browser? And I was, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just not going to engage into that conversation. I'm not even, you know, if you want to do it the way I want to do it, fine. Otherwise, you're happy to, happy to you know, use the, the Zendesk authoring tool. And it's funny because in the past couple of weeks, they came back to us and said, hey, you know what? We need to change all of the URLs of our images. We need to switch them. How do we do it automatically? They have like 700 like articles. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so we, we will probably, I mean, one of the things that we want to do is to definitely look at another platform for, for, for our community of documentation, make that more interactive enable all of the discussion and conversation features around the individual articles um, and other things that you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's on my plan for uh, the next few weeks or month um, is to work on the Jenkins job, basically. Um, it's sort of implemented really weird, and it's not consistent ac across the repos, which is a bad idea. Um, and it only publishes um, the article. It only republishes the article if it sees that the RST changed because it takes the diff between the git commits, and the git commits don't contain the HTML. Um, so that's something that I want to change. I want it to be smart enough to look at the HTML and take the diffs between that so that it can see 
when the HTML has changed and not just when the RSD file has changed. Um, and then the publishing script, it's kind of, it's, a, it's fallen to feature creep, I guess. Um, there, I didn't really have a good view of what I needed out of it until I was already into it knee deep and it, it needs to be refactored. Um, and the other thing we want to do is definitely get more contributions from customers and non-customers and other um, users in general into our into our depository repository. And we're I'm starting a program where uh, for new articles, new instructions, to dos tutorials, um, how to tips and tricks, um, we're gonna give um, we're gonna give contributors uh, uh, credit on our cloud, and so play a little bit with that. Um, and with that, yeah, I think we're on time for getting questions too, curiosities. Yeah. So if you have a question, just step up to the mic so that it can be heard on the video. Um, and feel free to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I got water. If you want <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm going to be that guy. Yeah. How much do you give back upstream to upstream docs? You can answer that <laughs> question. Um, so I was a big part of the, the Shade First app um, project because basically when he, was, he said, like, make this first app thing happen, Shade, <laughs> it, the, the docs for Shade didn't, they didn't exist. And so I was like, Shade is this cool thing. I should write that. Um, and then basic things like, like typos and, and links that are bad are easy to commit back upstream, but changes in text, um, and obviously things like SEO changes, we're not gonna try push that upstream because that doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, so for first app, we, we did a fair bit there, and then for, for the OpenStack manuals, it was mostly like typos and bad links and stuff like that. Yeah, so the, the other, while we were playing with Shade, he also added, um, uh, Swift support to Shade, which yeah. was missing uh, in order to complete the first application for OpenStack. Um, so other things that we I, I have in mind that I st still haven't happened is that a lot of the documentation that we have, the how-tos, the tutorials for how to do basic operation stuff on any OpenStack cloud, or as uh, they're generic. But I don't know where they would fit into the OpenStack community right now. So lots of the documentation for application developers right now is uh, first up on OpenStack, which is still sitting into the first the API site because of convenience, but it's it's an isolated piece. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not dedicated. There is no yet a bucket that says you know if you are a developer, if you want to deploy applications or develop applications targeting OpenStack, here's where you go. Um, uh, th that place is still not existent. So I'm hoping that by the end of this week, we will have kind of a plan with you, <laughs> with uh, Flanders, <laughs> uh, with all the people involved in the, the app ecosystem working group, uh, so that we can, we can play with that. Yeah. And that's another way to give back, is to be part of the app uh, ecosystem working group where I try to join. Yeah, I think, I think so I mentioned things like um, setting up a LAMP stack, that's our, our that's per, uh, currently on our own repo, but that, that sort of thing I think makes sense to go upstream. We just don't have a place for it currently. Um, and yeah, Sweet. awesome. Sweet. <laughs> cool. Does anybody use Zendesk or takes, you do? Interesting, Good to Sel know. you use Salesforce knowledge base? Yeah, cool. Can you use the mic? Sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, saying we used to use Zendesk for both support, and um, some articles didn't really work out for us. Um, part of it was, I mean, Zendesk is great, but we also want to do a lot of other things, not just support cases. And I think Zendesk is really, really great for support, but once you want to do like a portal for customers with all the rest of the cool stuff, yeah. it's just a bit limiting. So we switched to Salesforce. Um, the support runs from there, and also knowledge base is there. Um, we are now in the second phase. So we did first implementation of knowledge base, which was interesting, but um, 
the big challenge we ran into was the whole kind of update articles, right? Because the product changes, you have to update. And a lot of times, in, um, you know, having a doc team that's going to also update the knowledge base doesn't really... It's complicated because yeah. we also have doc team who is responsible for docs and they're like, well, you know, we don't have time, we don't have resources, how can we find somebody? So we are switching right now into um, kind of implementing KC KCS, um, which is knowledge centric support. Basically the idea there, and um, anybody can actually Google it and find it and like there's a bunch of articles and people talking about it and stuff, but it's more... Um, where you relax certain roles in publishing articles and it becomes more kind of community driven versus somebody has to approve every single world word and do like all of the, you know, reviews and publishers and, you know, multi-step process where it typically gets stuck somewhere. So that's what we're doing in terms of the knowledge base. Cool. cool. Do you use upstream documentation too? Um, we use portions of it. Majority okay. of it, we really try to not use it directly, we just provide the links, which is another yeah. challenge for us because sometimes links change. Yeah. And that's something, you know, we have to do all the time and go mm -hmm. and see if there's any bad links. But gotcha. we try not to copy the content because the yeah. then we have to, you know, make sure okay. again, yeah. do the same things because we did try it before, but then it just merging it c becomes complicated. Yeah. Makes sense. Any other question? Cool. What are some things that the upstream documentation community could do to help people like you um, who are trying to use our docs, bring them downstream? It, are, are there things we could do in an infrastructure way, things we could do just generally in terms of our conventions that might make it easier? It's a good question. Um, uh, I, hmm. I'm, I'm trying to think of something that doesn't sound selfish, like something that makes sense for the whole community and not just for us. Be exactly. And I, no, be specific. I, be specific. <laughs> I can't, I can't really think of. So to me, one of the things that um, was uh, surprising was to realize how much the, the heading, the headers, the titles of the pages or the articles themselves, they were so generic like launch instances, how, where, and how is that going to help uh, users find that information when they Google? Um, as it, as for SEO purposes, that's not um, optimal. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, Yeah, well, anywhere they should be, they should be looking good. I mean, we could, we could run this. There are companies that do the SEO analysis and they, they could tell us where the, the, w how to optimize the upstream documents. And we may want to talk, um, we, mo we may have, want to have that conversation. And um, the other thing that from the very, um, um, you know, egoistic point of view, uh, I would like, you know, the first results to be the Dreamos documentation uh, because, I mean, no, that's, that's actually, I mean, yeah, w well, because, you know, lying. we're a public cloud user, just like Crackspace is public cloud, uh, public cloud uh, deployer. So we use the knowledge base. We think of using, we hope to use the knowledge base also to, to drive traffic to, to our uh, websites. But um, so, you know, there is some optimization that I hope that can be done at the, at the OpenStack level. Um, uh, at the same level, I want to see the, the community as a whole to help public cloud deploy, deployments to, to, to get foot, to get traffic. May I propose a very strange idea? How about creating something which looks like the old style Web 0, 1, uh, link uh, l uh, ring of uh, links, basically OpenStack documentation, generic, and there is drop down list something which says those 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 vendors has own version of this, and I believe that uh, that allows user of one service maybe pick to other uh, documentation to get the whole picture, mm -hmm. and it should go to upstream saying this is multi tenancy documentation something like that. It makes sense. I think it might make sense to 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 think about something like that. Yeah, web rings or uh, similar approach where where 
we were talking, I mean, one of the things, one of the challenges of the, the OpenStack application ecosystem working group has been to find the places inside, I mean, OpenStack clouds where the code that was written would run as a test. So let's say I'm a developer. I'm sold on this idea of OpenStack. I found this great tutorial that teaches me how to deploy uh, a generic uh, proof of concept as an application on, on top of OpenStack. And now what? Where do I go? I got the tutorials. I got the knowledge myself. And where are the APIs and the points that I can use? And how much are they going to cost? You know, where, you know, which ones are they? And it, it funny, uh, it's funny because um, when, when I did it the first time, it was painful it, just to run the basic documentation that was written for TriStack, I uh, know, uh, for a DevStack installation and uh, two private clouds. When I run it on our public cloud, nothing was running. I had to tweak and blah, blah, blah. Then I found out about Shade, and then I gave it to him. Like, OK, you finish. I'm done. <laughs> um, but other people have tried it. Um, in fact, there is a talk about this uh, this week uh, from uh, Marcela Bonel um, and others at Intel. They have done an anal a cross uh, analysis of the developer experience on different clouds, public clouds, from Amazon to Rackspace to, to, to other companies. And uh, they had written up the, the the summary of that. It's, it's an interesting topic. And to continue this idea, right now there is a big topic about sites, continuous integration. I believe the same thing should be applied to all samples and documentation. And yeah. maybe some kind of checklist, automatic checklist, saying this, 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 this systems are supporting, this not. And this gives right. two way link you can see all oh, those guys in upstream decided to do something crazy we do not support right now we should all say them please stop or adopt uh, our system and uh, the main thing it should be done by robots not by humans that's that's true yeah it uh, it's basically what ref stack wants to do but with real life scenarios instead of uh, abstract api calls that that's a cool idea cool all right. Well, if there are no more questions, I guess we can go get coffee or um, hop to the next session. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.